I'm Diana Fleischman. I'm an evolutionary psychologist, and welcome to Cafe Classroom. Evolutionary psychology looks at the human mind through the lens of evolution. Basically, we think that evolution doesn't just work from the neck down, doesn't just make things like fingers and hands and toenails, it also makes adaptations in the human mind. And when we think about adaptations in the human mind, we think about what would have solved ancestral problems. So what many psychologists do is they come up with what might be called proximate explanations. And there's two different levels of explanation for things. What evolutionary psychologists do is they look at the ultimate explanation. And that's not to say it's better than the proximate explanation, but it is to say that it's looking at a functional reason. So if you were to ask me, why are men on average taller than women, right? There's a proximate explanation for that, which is men have bigger bones than women do. But there's also an ultimate explanation for that, which is that men have competed with each other over evolutionary time. Taller, larger men tended to be more successful in that competition, and therefore men ended up being bigger than women. And actually the degree to which men and women differ in size is indicative of how monogamous a species is. So it means that we're slightly not monogamous, but that's a story for a different day. <laughs> so in terms of evolutionary psychology, we see the human mind as being shaped by two different forces. People like to talk about natural selection. That is something like the survival of the fittest is what people would say. And those are things like being able to find out where food is, to remember how to take care of your children in order to survive those kinds of things. But there's also a really important aspect that people don't talk about very much, which is something called sexual selection. And sexual selection is the other necessary piece for sexually reproducing species such as ourselves, right? You have to be able to attract a mate, otherwise it doesn't really matter if you survived at all. And sexual selection is one reason why we might be able to tell stories, why we might have humor, why you might appreciate art. Some of you might have seen a uh, butterfly <clears throat> and the outside of it looks just like a leaf, and the inside is bright blue. The outside was shaped by natural selection. It looks like a leaf so it can better evade predators. But the deep blue of the inside of this butterfly is order, in order to attract females of that same species because they're signaling their quality with that deep blue color. Now, according to evolutionary psychologists, there's, and, and just evolutionary biologists generally, there's three main products of evolution. That is adaptations, that's byproducts and that's noise. And as evolutionary psychologists, we're really interested in how these adaptations in the mind work. So if you look at an adaptation, that's something like an umbilical cord, right? A baby it develops in the womb and it gets nutrients from its mother through the, the umbilical cord. And then when you're born, they snip off that umbilical cord and you're left with a navel, a belly button. Now, that belly button doesn't help you attract mates, you can't collect food in it, there's not very many things that you can do with it, so it's just a byproduct. It's actually not adaptive in and of itself. And then the final piece is noise. These are just things that might happen in the environment, perturbations. And there's been a lot of controversy and conversation about exactly what it is certain disorders are. Is schizophrenia a byproduct of normal creativity, or is it the result of some kind of virus or bacteria that infects the mother and then derails normal uh, brain functioning. Is homosexuality actually adaptive? Is it good for something? Can it actually help increase your indirect reproductive success? So in one culture, for example, in Samoa, the Fafafine, they are men who uh, dress like women, who sleep with men, but they take really good care of their nieces and nephews. And it seems like this might be a strategy in that particular culture. And this is the question about whether or not these things are adaptations or byproducts or noise. So just to go back one more step, what evolutionary psychologists tend to do is to look at things either from the perspective of how would the human mind be designed to solve a particular problem. And we think about problems that were very likely to have happened. So let's say you see a, a, the Mars rover, let's say you're an alien and you see the Mars rover on Mars, then you might not know anything about it before you take it apart but you do know that it was able to collect energy from the sun, that it was able to withstand corrosion from the environment. You know that it has certain design features because of its ability to survive on that planet. And we know that humans have certain possible adaptations, psychological adaptations, because of the mere fact that we're here. So one really interesting example is incest avoidance. How do we avoid having sex with and reproducing with people who are our close kin? 
And one way is by looking at cues in the environment. If you're trying to des design an incest avoidance mechanism, how would you design it? What kind of cues would you put in and, and take out? And if you've been living with somebody all your life, that's a pretty good indicator that they are your kin. If you saw somebody when they were a baby breastfeeding at your mother's breath, that's a pretty good indicator that they are kin. And you see this in other cultures as well. There are cultures in which uh, a little girl is sent to live with her future husband's family and the girl and the boy are brought up together. Those people have pretty low reproductive success because they are getting all these indications that they're actually siblings. And there's other things that you can look at. So you can look at things that happen normally in day to day. We know that people exhibit disgust sensitivity. That's my specialty is disgust sensitivity. So what is disgust sensitivity for and why are there differences in disgust sensitivity? And what you can do is you can formulate a hypothesis, collect data about whether or not that that would be an adaptive strategy, and then decide whether or not you think that this might be a design feature in the human mind or whether or not it's some kind of byproduct or some kind of noise instead. So in the case of disgust, people really differ in terms of their disgust sensitivity. Women are much more disgust sensitive than men. And the idea is that disgust serves a bunch of different functions. One of them is to avoid potential pathogens in the environment. The other one is also to avoid reproducing with people who are not optimal to reproduce with. And then there's another idea that we actually use disgust also as a moral emotion. So evolutionary psychology gets a lot of flack for a variety of reasons. One reason is because people say that it's unfalsifiable, right? But we always think that evolution it was involved in the development of the human mind, that evolutionary processes are at work in our human psychology. So that is not something that we try to falsify. But in terms of the specifics of how we think evolution was at work in our human psychologies, that is something that we try to falsify, that we make predictions about and we use hypotheses. So there's been a variety of ideas in evolutionary psychology, things that have been falsified. So take the case of sexual assault. For a long time, there were people who said, well, <clears throat> sexual assault is more likely to be committed by men who have no other way of getting a mate. They are, have no resources, they're not attractive to the opposite sex, and this is why men uh, commit this crime. And the actual evidence shows that it's men who are more sexually successful who tend to be more likely to also say that they're engaging in these kinds of behaviors. So that's one idea that was falsified, which was called the loser male hypothesis, right? Um, there's another uh, you know, huge controversy right now about whether or not women at ovulation actually change their mate-seeking behavior. Are women at ovulation looking for somebody with good genes, somebody with more masculinized features? There was a bunch of data that showed that that might be the case, and now with much larger samples, it might not be the case. So our field is really in flux, but there's a lot of things going on, and I think that with open science, with larger data sets, and with better development of our hypotheses, we are really going to, to learn a lot more about the human mind and about how the mind interacts with culture.